I'm about to go live and I'll just uh, introduce all of us. Go live. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself. I always want to do the Bill O'Reilly freak out about doing it live. Oh, you can start that way if you like. No. <laughs> all right. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. We are live on Facebook, YouTube, wherever the internet will let us exist. Um, Thanks for watching Hudgens Talks. Uh, my name is Kate Driscoll. I'm the Public Programs Manager for the Hudgens Center for Art and Learning. And I'll let my co-host introduce himself. I am Ty Nicholson. I'm the Director of Studio and Facility Operations here. And today we're lucky enough to have Marty Tubles with us. Um, he is an artist and art educator. I'm going to let him introduce himself. You can go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marty Two Bulls Jr. I'm an artist and educator uh, based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Welcome, Marty. It's nice to see you again, man. Yeah, thank uh, you again. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah. yeah, my pleasure. So for anyone who's not familiar with your work, will you tell people a little bit about your uh, creative, professional, educational background? Yeah, so um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist, um, which means I, I uh, work in a lot of different mediums. Um, I grew up in an artist family, so I kind of grew up making stuff my whole life. Um, my dad's an artist and a, a designer, and um, so I grew up in his studio drawing, painting, sculpting, um, working a lot in like wood and stone, and, like acrylic, things like that. Um, eventually I went off to school and um, I went to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And when I got down there, um, I started looking for mediums that I hadn't had experience with growing up. And the two I kind of landed on were ceramics and printmaking. So that was my focus at um, IAIA in Santa Fe. Um, when I finished there, uh, I stuck around Santa Fe for about 10 years, um, I lived there working, you know, keeping my studio practice going um, and working in a lot of contemporary art galleries, which kind of became like a second education for me. Um, like that's where I met Ty, for instance, we worked at a Santa Fe, worked at Santa Fe Clay, a contemporary ceramic studio and gallery. Um, but I also worked for many other contemporary galleries there and, you know, met a lot of like um, a wide variety of contemporary artists. Um, and from there, uh, I got an offer to teach at uh, a college in South Dakota. Uh, it's called Ogallala Lakota College. It's a tribal college based on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And that's where I'm from. I'm Ogallala Lakota. Um, so I was really kind of getting, you know, still always making art, um, but kind of getting tired of galleries. Uh, it's just high-end retail, you know. So when I had the opportunity to go home and like teach, like I really jumped at it. And in 2017, I moved back to South Dakota and I've been teaching art and working, making art here since. Nice. How has the uh, transition been to the classrooms from being a, a professional and contemporary artist for so long? Um, it's been pretty good. Um, I mean, it does have its challenges. Um, like I didn't ever plan on really being an educator, um, but I do like teaching. Um, and I think that'll always be a part of my practice is like teaching in some capacity. Uh, formal education is a little challenging because there's a lot of rules and bureaucracy that you have to deal with. And that's kind of my least favorite part of teaching. I like being in the class and getting our hands dirty and making stuff. And I don't so much like assessment or reports and that kind of stuff. And I guess too, you have a, an additional, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but you know, the challenge of having a disenfranchised campus. So you have multiple places you need to be instead of like one centralized location. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so the camp, the mission of the college is to serve this rural population. So it's, it's decentralized. We have 11 college centers spread out pretty far. Um, and we're kind of working on creating an, an art center now. We're kind of in the process of putting something together that's more centralized because it's hard to teach studio arts without like a permanent studio, you know, I think it's real, real tricky. And are you all uh, virtual, I would assume, too, like a lot of the universities and most of the universities around the United States? Yeah, we've been virtual since March. Mm. Our uh, leadership took a really strong position on quarantine and, you know, the health and safety of the students in the community. So we, uh, yeah, it's like March, like beginning of March, we stopped face-to-face -face classes, went virtual, and since then, yeah, we've been virtual. How's that affected um, the way you teach? I know you said your favorite part is getting your hands dirty. Have you had to rethink a lot? Yeah, yeah, I've had to really like learn how to do some things or even use some like abilities that were kind of I have some things that I've been able to do, but haven't really had the opportunity to do. So like, um, you know, for a while I studied um, filmmaking and, you know, working in nonlinear editing software and things like that. And now I find myself like making instructional videos where like I'm recording myself working, you know, different angles and editing that and putting it together and putting YouTube videos up for my students to watch. And um, yeah, I've just been trying to keep up I am um, like like uh, one of the things I did is I bought like a, a Wacom tablet, a drawing digital drawing tablet for my own practice, but also like it's kind of the easiest way to do demonstrations in drawing classes. Otherwise, like there's this issue of like the camera in your hand and like trying to record what your hand's doing and it's just really clumsy and yeah. And which classes are you teaching right now? Uh, this semester, I'm teaching a drawing one class, um, a graphic design one class, an art appreciation class, and a, uh, a Photoshop class. Um, has becoming uh, an art educator changed the way uh, you make your your own art as a as an artist? Um, yeah, I mean, this has been an interesting period. You know, I'm 35. And I've been making art my whole life. Like I have sketchbooks like date back to when I was a little kid. Um, and I'm kind of at this period in my career where I have this like kind of I'm amassing this large, larger body of work, um, you know, and it's been good for me, like articulating my process with students and talking to them about how I make art and how I think about art and then going through that work myself and kind of looking at my work it's been kind of a, a I, feel, I feel like I'm kind of realigning a lot of my goals and aesthetic values, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so teaching has been, I think especially with my perspective, it's um, it's been really beneficial to kind of get that realignment. Um, maybe this is a really big question, but can you tell us a little bit about, about your art or your process? Yeah. Um, so man, I got, I'm like, my studio is kind of crazy because, you know, I'm working in a lot of different mediums. Um, so for instance, like, um, any piece these days usually has like three or four separate processes. Um, it might be like a clay sculpture in an, you know, in a, in a kind of found object assemblage that has like, you know, a uh, silk screen, you know, that was an uh, image that was created in Photoshop or Illustrator, and then, you know, silk screen onto the surface of the, the mirror. Um, it, it's, uh, it's hard to explain without showing it, <laughs> because it is like, I don't know, like I'm working in clay, I'm working on the computer, I'm working with traditional like drafting tools, like ink pens and things like that. Um, kind of all over the place. So like at any given time, I can have like a lot of technology out and then a lot of like mud and clay or like knives for, you know, carving or sculpting and um, kind of all over the place. I'm also a musician too. So like I have a lot of instruments in my space. Um, and I don't know, it's, I, you know, I've oftentimes heard criticism about like having two, your hands in too many pots or 
know, kind of being a jack of all trades and a master of none, which is, you know, an important thing to consider. Like, I don't really consider myself like a ceramicist, you know, I know people who work in clay and that's their whole focus is that medium and they become really good at it because that's where they, they focus. Um, and I don't really consider myself like a painter, you know, cause it's, I'm not as, you know, as focused. Um, but I really, for me, those separate mediums and techniques and practices, they kind of influence each other for me, like even music, you know, um, when I'm working through a project, a lot of times I have an idea first and I kind of let the idea guide me towards the medium. And sometimes that lands on like clay, sometimes that lands on like paper or canvas. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just it kind of depends. And I try to keep that fluidity and switch between them. Like oftentimes I'll stop, like just, you know, get away from clay mm -hmm. and focus on music for a while, or I'll get away from, you know, the computer and try to get back into more like hand processes, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was no, no, you go ahead. No, I was just uh, going to jump on what you were saying, Marty. It's like, uh, I, I, I tend to agree. I feel like sometimes if you just, if one sticks with one thing, like let's say painting or something, and that's all you do painting. It, it, for me, it feels limiting. So being able to have and move around through different meetings is and somewhat, mediums is somewhat free, freeing. And I think it lets you uh, create a little bit more freely. Um, I was interested too, because I was kind of revisiting your artwork earlier and I was kind of in my mind creating my own narrative of the things like the objects I was seeing. Um, mm. Would you mind speaking to some of your work a little bit in particular, the, uh, uh, is it Dementia Americana series? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, don't feel wanna... pressured to do so. I'm just, I'm just curious. No, no, not at all. Um, so that that series came from a show. Do you want to share the work on the screen? Is that possible? Ooh, Kate, can you do that? Yeah, I'll get on it right now. Kate has control. It's on my website, so you can yeah. just check that. You can check it out there. So that was a uh, a show that I curated um, in at the I can't remember the place. It was an art center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Lux, the Lux Art Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. And that was a group show, was a three person show uh, with myself, another artist, uh, he's actually my cousin, Michael Tubols, and uh, another friend of mine, uh, Chinupa Luger. Um, and that show was kind of examining sort of uh, narratives in kind of American history. Um, so, um, you know, th thinking about kind of how we process our histories as a country and as individuals. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's that one there. Yeah, so there's some examples of those mixed media processes where like I'm working in clay, um, like in this instance, there's slip cast ceramic bottles. Um, and there's a found medicine cabinet that I've made into sort of a shadow box. And then there's printing um, uh, commercial printing on the front of the, the glass. So there's like a lot of, just like a mixture of stuff. Um, and the one on the right, that's a cyanotype. Um, the cigarette butts on the bottom, those are, oh, those are all clay. Um, they're all- uh, oh, oh, the cigarette butts are all clay? Yeah, those are all oh, clay. Cool. That was a collaboration with Chinupa. Um, he sat down and like spent a day just making little ceramic cigarettes. <laughs> oh, those are rad. I, I used to love making little ceramic cigarette butts, but I never did them that well. Good job, Chinupa and Marty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he made them and went through and like glazed them and painted them and like spent way too much time on <laughs> each of those individual things. But I had the idea. It's been so I'd, time consuming because they are to study that like the color it all the texture looks like a even well i'm a retired smoker so like i personally really know like what a realistic cigarette but looks like like even the bottoms on the ends it's like a little discoloration in the filter from dragging the tobacco through it all, so that, like, all the tanning of those, your lungs yeah all the tanning of the lungs 
so the stains are on there and yeah um i had the idea and i wanted to do that but i i knew like i just didn't want a new real cigarette butts would be kind of an issue yeah um so that worked out that worked out well um and then yeah there's like bullet casings on the top of that one and that's a Ciano type print in the back so yeah i'm always kind of mixing processes and mediums you know and this work is uh, again, kind of addressing those narratives, um, you know, how we talk about our history, you know, whether as a nation or personally, individually, um, you know, kind of approaching some of those ideas. And the iconography in my work is a mixture of like um, kind of common, you know, ubiquitous objects, but there's also a lot of cultural references in my work. Um, so for instance, like the buffalo skull on the front of that um, is that's the buffalo skull that's in my house. Mm. Um, that's my my skull. I um, mean, it's part of a bigger story um, for me personally. It's not just like a generic piece of imagery. This has kind of a bigger, deeper cultural uh, context. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the uh some of this stuff if you want to scroll a little bit we can keep looking you'll see some of this iconography kind of pop up over over and over yeah the milk jugs are something i i keep looking back at and really uh thinking about the materiality of you know an actual milk jug and like you know the i could be reading this wrong way like the kind of throwaway culture of milk jugs like something you use once throw it away and forget about it but it, yet it lasts forever and when you turn it into ceramic, it's kind of recreating that throwaway object, but then ceramic also essentially lasts forever too. Yeah, I know that's, yeah, you know, you're totally right. And, you know, it's, it's, I've always kind of been sacrilegious with my clay work. Um, the first, the first <laughs> clay objects I made when I got into clay were ashtrays. Um, but they were like, I, I took like slip cast, those like uh, greenware, um, you know, like those paint paint pottery shops, they have mm -hmm. like those kind of greenware sculptures. And I got into like cutting those and like kind of collaging those sculptures together. So the first round of ceramic stuff I ever did were like these ashtrays that had all these like weird, like religious iconography, like in the ashtray. Yeah. Well, that I, I mean, that's good because you were talking about like not staying in one medium, you know, I don't know, too long or whatever, because like, I guess, you know, if you spend a lifetime doing ceramics, you can have a tendency to become kind of a purist and like doing these, like, uh, like you said, uh, sacrilegious things with ceramic materials is kind of an interesting approach, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how I am with most of my, most of the material, even like printmaking, like, you know, printmaking, much like ceramics is a very like narrow specialized field with a lot of rules and like, a lot of process. And that's, I think that's one thing I like about clay too, is like, I think I like anything where there's like lots of process. You know, you start here and then like you go through the different steps and these different phases of it. And then it, you know, ends, you get your final result like a month later or something. Um, but yeah, back to those, those jugs, you know, um, as part of that kind of being a little bit sacrilegious with the medium and taking an object that is a throwaway kind of uh, piece of detritus normally and kind of trying to elevate it through the medium and the material into this like art form you know and you know thinking about those kind of ideas like what what is art you know what what can art be you know a lot of these questions that like Marcel Duchamp started asking a long time ago you know with his fountain that urinal that he he had, he had made. Um, those are ideas that I still think about a lot, especially from my cultural perspective as a Lakota artist. Um, you know, our art practice is separate from sort of the Western paradigm and the Western kind of canon and progression of, of art. I mean, it does collide at different points, you know, and it does, they do influence, it does, they do influence one another, but, you know, it's in a lot of ways, it's a different perspective. And so one of the things I, I th was thinking about, you know, is, you know, and these things are called like traditional art. I can't remember, I think I call them traditional artifacts. Can you scroll down a little bit? Yeah, there's just like traditional artifact 
number 17, number 16, kind of giving them sort of that um, referencing like the way museum, like objects in a museum are cataloged, like kind of just cold and generic titles. Um, but, you know, one of the things I think a lot about with this, specifically with the milk jugs were like modern vessels. Um, you know, traditionally in, in my, in my tribe's history, you know, our vessels were like uh, dried stomach bladders from like the buffalo, um, these, these pouches, and that's kind of what we'd use to carry liquid. Those were our, our vessels. Um, and today, you know, if I was to look for like a modern traditional like vessel that are in like most of the refrigerators of the people from my culture and community and tribe, you know, it would be this milk jug, like that's the kind of new vessel, whether there's like water or milk or orange juice or whatever, you know, these are kind of our contemporary vessels. So, you know, looking at those ideas of like kind of modern Lakota culture and what that looks like and what that um, means, I guess. Um. You had talked about how you try not to stay with one uh, medium too much. And that's interesting to me that as an artist, that the medium is a means to the process to you, rather than sometimes it seems like it's the other way around for some people. Like it's just, it truly is this like pure outlet for you, like whatever means possible to get it. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you ever feel like you're just stagnant in your visual arts? So you hop over to music and do you feel those influence each other or you get halfway through a project that's musical and think this should be visual or have a visual component? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think we all as artists and creative people hit, hit like those creative blocks where Maybe you're in a, at a stage where like you just don't know what to make, or maybe you have an idea and don't really know how to make it, or maybe you're you're making it but it's not quite hitting the target, or hitting the idea. Um, so yeah, when I get to those kind of places, that's when I really try to shift my um, shift my process or my thinking. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there are some things that I have that are still in process. Like if I don't feel like I can finish them. The way I want to, whether that's because of my means or ability, or if there's just like I haven't quite solved the puzzle yet, the kind of conceptual puzzle, I'll I'll set it aside and leave it alone for a while, and I'll go and do something else, and it'll still be in my head, and I'll still be thinking about it. And for me, a lot of it is like it is like a puzzle, like figuring out like either how to make it or how to express the idea, um, the way I want to, and yeah, like. Yeah, like playing music, you know, is a, uh, you know, is a, is, is also like problem solving too, you know. So like I start thinking about, you know, chords and um, scales and you know, in the relationship between instruments when I'm recording or something, and um, that will sometimes unlock other parts of my brain that allow me to come back and say, you know, okay, this is what I need to do with this sculpture. Or this is what I need to do with this this piece of artwork like like how olympians cross train yeah so, <laughs> um, well honestly uh, honestly like the artists that i know who are who i do consider like purists in their medium they always dabble on something else like the painters i know are always like playing with some other medium or they may not be showing it in their their gallery shows or in their portfolios but they're always doing something else and I think that's important, like whether or not it becomes how you describe yourself, how you present yourself in your career as an artist, like, you know, it's good to have, good to experiment. Um, do you think that your practice has changed over time? Um, yes and no. I mean, I'm always trying to learn new things, so, um, you know, there are, I do get into new mediums and, you know, try to adapt new tools or new technology or software. Um, but I think, you know, the 
at the root of my process is that kind of curiosity and that desire to kind of problem solve, you know? Um, and I think that's kind of been consistent and something I'm kind of realizing the older I've gotten and the more work I have, especially trying to, you know, talk through some of this stuff with students, um, you know, kind of realized like, you know, the most important thing is that kind of curiosity and like impulse to express myself. Have you had any uh, memorable responses to your work either from your students or just from people coming to see your work in galleries? Yeah, I mean, I've gotten it all, man. Like, <laughs> you know, as a native artist, like I get grouped into some shows that probably aren't what people expect when they think they're seeing artwork from a native person. So like, especially in Santa Fe, which is, you know, a very, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a big art market just in general, but there's also a really big native art presence there, contemporary native art presence. So like I've been in shows where like collectors would come and see my work and would just like, you know, laugh at it or be disgusted by it or just not get it, you know? And yeah, I've had, um, and those are some of kind of my favorites just because like I feel that way about their perspectives too. Like I think I just kind of laugh at, we kind of laugh at each other. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, you know, I've had, you know, good, good experiences too. Like I've certainly had a lot of good opportunities and a lot of support in my career. Um, it's not something I dwell on too much. Like I try to keep, keep the, the old ego in check, you know, <laughs> um, try to keep that out of my practice. And, um, you know, I try to, that's another thing that I, I also try to keep that kind of negativity out of my practice as well. Um, that's something I tell my students is like, you know, you're going to apply for stuff and you're not going to get it. You're going to apply for grants and residencies and fellowships and graduate school and you're, you're not going to get it. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the hardest things to do is to keep working and keeping like true to your creative calling or voice through all that. And, you know, uh, try to instill in them the practice of like keeping that out of their studio, keeping it out of their, um, art making practice because um, it's important to to follow that that voice. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important bit of advice too. Is this to know that the rejections will come and then they will continue to come pretty much forever. I mean, because there's hundreds of thousands or thousands of people you know applying for the same thing. Um, uh, has the transition out of Santa Fe? into a smaller art market? Has it been a little bit more freeing for you creatively or do you feel a little less pressure or vice versa? Um, I feel a little more lonely up here, here in some ways mm -hmm. um, just because I feel like there are a lot less like-minded artists where I am. Um, Santa Fe, I mean, there were a lot of, um, I you know there were a lot of like-minded artists in Santa Fe that are kind of were like me, but there are also others too, you know, I'm not trying to say like Santa Fe was some kind of haven, but, you know, I feel like I had more friends, artist friends that kind of had the same ideas about art that I do. Um, I mean, just the nature of South Dakota being, having such a, a small population of people, um, you know, the art here and the art scene here is a little more like, a, like you would expect from a rural community. Um, not to put it down or anything, but just like um, more, I guess I don't know, not a lot of uh, exploration or risk taking, I guess, maybe is the way to put it. Um, like more traditional kind of art practices, um, which there's nothing wrong with. It's just not my cup of tea. You know, there's not, I'm a weirdo and I like being around other weirdos. Um, and there's not as many weirdos here in Rapid City, South Dakota, as they were in Santa Fe. What do you do to counteract that loneliness? Um, I try to travel and visit people. <laughs> I was. <laughs> um, it's been a little tricky being uh, quarantined. And, you know, I've been taking it really seriously and trying to, like, you know, not um, like keep the spread of this thing down as much as possible. So I've been home and like isolated and you know trying to be re 
keep my community health in mind with the things that I do. So, um, yeah, I, don't know, I just try to keep in touch with people, um, visit, you know, um, share work. Like that's been important is getting feedback from people that I respect, um, you know, getting critiques from other artists that I, that I know are kind of like-minded and it's, it's a little more of an effort it requires more like digital communication, like what we're doing now or like sending emails and stuff. But I really try to keep that up as much as possible. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed you've been doing recently are making those uh, the bandanas with the uh, the treaty on it. Because uh, early on in the pandemic, the uh, the Lakota Nation tried to uh, wanted to quarantine and shut down the borders. Correct? And yeah. Stop people from coming in to kind of help keep you guys keep everyone safe. Yeah. So. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, um, it's one of the poorest counties in the in the country. Like it, it's transitioned between like one of like the, the poorest to like the fifth poorest. I mean, it just depends on the year in this country. But it's um, there's not a lot of resources there in terms of like hospitals and businesses. Um, uh, there's not a lot of infrastructure, you know, only recently has there been a real big push to getting like decent internet throughout the reservation. The last couple of years, they've been like kind of wiring, you know, kind of that basic infrastructure into some of the communities and getting that accessibility. Um, so when this corn, when this disease started seeming to be more serious, when the people started taking it more serious, the tribe took a really um, hard stance and decided to close the borders to the reservation. Um, so there's a standing quarantine that only allows tribal members in and out um, or people with business in the tribe in or out, but like tourists aren't allowed to come visit. Um, they do allow pass through traffic. I mean, it's really honestly like not a big deal. Mm -hmm unless like um, you're trying to go and visit some, like if you're an outsider coming in to like visit a cultural center or something. Um, and that was done to protect the tribal members. Um, our healthcare system there is a, a, a Indian Health Services, which is pretty historically underfunded. And I mean, they have a hard time serving the community in a normal good year, um, but certainly not during a pandemic. Um, I mean, our, the big hospitals in the region outside of the reservation, the main kind of commercial hospitals aren't really prepared for this and especially our small IHS hospitals. So there's a really a much higher risk of this disease making a much bigger impact in our communities. Um, you know, there's a lot of poverty, there's a, you know, there's an issue with housing. So a lot of times you have houses with multiple families living in them. Like if one person gets sick, it's not like they can really quarantine very easily for two weeks. Um, so I think there's some of those things that people kind of take for granted. Like, okay, you get sick and you quarantine for two weeks, you just go home and stay home and watch Netflix and you won't get anybody else sick. But you know, some of these communities, you know, what that means is the whole house is gonna get it. And there's not really any other option. Like there's not another apartment to rent or hotel to go to, like it's, this is it. Um, and this disease has a um, greater risk to older people, as we know. And in our culture, um, you know, a, a big uh, part of our culture is our oral tradition. You know, um, and that's still an important part of who we are today. Like our elders are really important to us. They hold a high you know, place of respect in our communities and our cultural practices. And they're seen as like, you know, culture bearers, you know, uh, kind of knowledge bearers. And, you know, this disease presents a risk of, you know, greatly impacting that those members of our community and which, you know, in turn has a great risk of impacting our culture. You know, losing those people is, is terrible. You know, losing, all, you know, losing human life is terrible. But with that life, you also lose like this big part of our, kind of living oral tradition. And um, 
and this is one of those pieces. So in response, you know, I was thinking about this and I had an idea for this piece and I wanted to do something and I was struggling with how to express my support and I um, express this idea um, of like, you know, why it's important that they're quarantining. Because one of the things that happened um, early on is we have a uh, a pretty staunch Republican governor in office right now, Christy Noem. And um, she almost immediately um, started demanding that the tribe open its borders up, um, making claims about like how, you know, it was impacting people's travel and like business and things like that. And really they were kind of like, they're really kind of false claims. It was more of a power move. You know, our uh, all you know federally recognized tribes have the right to, to have a right to um, individual sovereignty. So Pine Ridge is technically a sovereign nation that gets to decide how they, you know, govern and how they rule and how, you know, how they manage their land and things like that. And, you know, it became a power struggle between the governor and the tribe and their justifications for reopening the border um, were A, uh, against the law, you know, she doesn't have the power to force them to do anything. Um, and the, the basis of that law is in the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. It keeps kind of scrolling. I'm, I'm sorry, I wish it wouldn't scroll all the time, but when it comes back to that main image, you'll see that it's, um, there's text all the way around the outside of the border. And that's the treaty. That's the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty in its entirety. That's the document that um, ensures our tribal sovereignty and a lot of the current agreements that we have with the US government. And, you know, that's 1868 seems like a long time ago, but, you know, really it's not. Um, you know, my great grandfather, um, uh, comes again, you know, he fought at the Battle of Little Bighorn and he was born before this document and he raised my grandfather who, you know, I've known, like it's, it's not that far away from, you know, where we're at today, but people kind of forget about this, you know, they don't understand like, well, why do Native people in this country have these special rights or these special privileges and it's because of these agreements that were made with the U.S. government. Um, so yeah, I had this idea, you know, I knew I wanted to incorporate the treaty. I knew, um, I wanted to make a statement about our quarantine and, you know, in old, uh, kind of nautical, uh, ways of communication back before like radios and stuff, when ships were out to sea, they'd use signal flags. I don't know if you've seen those, they'd run them up on their masts and, there are these different signal flags, flags would say different things and that's how they communicate with other ships like line of sight. They'd look at each other's you know, flags and they could figure out what's going on. And the international signal for quarantine is that yellow and black checkering. Um, so if your ship was, was sick or if you needed to quarantine, they'd run that flag up and that'd communicate to other ships what was going on. And so I, I incorporated that with the, the those that those geometric shapes those are supposed to be teepees that's our tribal flag it's it, do, it doesn't look like that um if you look it up it's red and white so i took the the imagery from the tribal flag and um juxtaposed it over the quarantine flag and then you know drew the treaty in um and i like I was talking about with process, like I had this idea, I knew how, I knew what, it, what I wanted to do generally, but I couldn't quite land on how to do it. Like, I mean, I could have made a print, um, you know, like a, a litho print or a silk screen print, you know, if we did it on paper, or maybe did it on canvas or, you know what I mean? I was thinking a little too, too much in the direction of like fine art. Um, you know, and one of the issues that I've had with that kind of thinking in my practice is, you know, as I, as I do better in my art career and as I, you know, you know, sell stuff and, you know, get museum acquisitions and things like that, my artwork has become a lot more inaccessible. You know, like people that I know really don't have own my work or have my work. 
in some of my best work that I feel that is really hits, you know, the target on what I'm trying to do, like that work is kind of hidden. Like it's in maybe a museum collection that may come, might come out like once every few years, if I'm lucky, you know, people just, people just don't get to see it, you know, or especially own it. So with this piece, I wanted to make something that um, would express the idea, but also something that like anybody could have really. Um, and especially thinking about tribal members. And that's where my audience was first was with those people. And like this image here that's up on the screen, that's, those are one of the border checkpoints. And um, I gave a bunch of those bandanas to those guys to use as sort of like a, a kind of a tangible symbol of our um, resilience and stance on um, protecting our you know, vulnerable community members. Um, and I like the idea of the bandana because, again, it's kind of sacrilegious. Like I could have, um, if I did this on canvas, you know, and I could sell it to somebody or, you know, sell it to a museum and, you know, it'd be precious and high fine art. But on a bandana, it's kind of like it's a utilitarian object. You can use it as a mask. You can use it as a flag. That's what some of those guys were doing. You could, you know, blow your nose with it, you know, clean up a spill or you know every, everybody has a use for a bandana um rich or poor or whoever whatever your cultural background is and people can buy these on your website right yeah so they're available on the website if you want to buy one um that's the other thing that i've, I've done too is kind of figuring out ways through this quarantine of like making my work accessible um and there's a shop on the site with some stuff. It's still kind of new. It's a new bit of technology that I've been figuring out. Um, but, you know, still making these objects that are like, even honestly too expensive for me to afford. Like I got to move this artwork, you know, but also trying to make things that people can buy and have and, you know, use and things like that. So I have a few stickers on there and that bandana, but I'm working on some other projects that are kind of along this idea of and really what it is. And this is kind of, I think where I'm going more and more is sort of moving away from the gallery system of art making. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. If any gallery wants to buy work or show work or whatever, like I'm a business person. Right. But um, I think for my practice, I need to have a place where I can, send work or send ideas that are, are more accessible. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was interesting what you're saying about, you know, 1868 not being that long ago. And you're totally right. It's two, three generations removed from that treaty. And I think, you know, people often will say something is a long time or happened a long time ago when it benefits them the most. Um, you know, so like, you know, how closely you're connected to that time frame. I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful statement to put on that utilitarian object. And it is being, it forces the person that has it to become more intimate with it because they're using it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And instead of having it in this exclusive place in a gallery removed a couple steps from the viewer. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also a teaching tool as well. Yeah. That treaty, I really made sure that it was legible so you can read it. And, you know, if you're in a lot of pe and a lot of people are interested in this treaty because it does make a big impact, especially tribal members. It makes a big impact on their lives. You know, it has historically, it does today and it will continue to impact their lives, you know, in the future. So like, you know, my, the way I envisioned this was like one of those border checkpoint people, you know, sitting out on the, the prairie, like, you know, keeping watch and maybe blowing her nose in the bandana, but also like being able to sit and read through the treaty um, and kind of learn more about it, you know? Yeah. We have a, a couple people saying hello to you. Uh, Kate King says uh, she loves your art. Uh, Ashley Lynch is a, one of our longtime viewers of this, our our uh, series of artist talks. Uh, it's very cool. LaDonna is one of our students. She 
says, uh, we have lots of good weirdos here. Welcome. Cool. So in response to your, your, your weirdo. Thank you, yes, thank um, you. Yeah, Ashley Lynch, Lynch also says that she loves the milk jugs. Gee. Yes. Thank you. And then also, uh, LaDonna also says, uh, thank you for your appreciation of the elders and the importance of the oral tradition. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's important. I've been thinking a lot about because like I'm doing a lot of research. There's some other projects I'm working on that are kind of culturally based and I've been doing research and, you know, I do a lot of like book research where I'm reading books and, you know, learning about an issue, an idea through the books. Um, and that's important. You know, reading is really important and that kind of documentation is really important. But there's also like such a value in just talking to people, especially people that know about something or were a part of something like, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's kind of anecdotal, like, I don't know, I, I get that oral tradition is so, I think it's so important and valuable. So do you have any advice for young upcoming artists or aspiring artists or older aspiring artists? Yeah, I guess um, my advice is just like, you know, um, keep doing what you're doing. Like, you know, your perspective is important. Your ideas are important. Um, they might not always bring you a lot of fame or accolades or like money maybe, but, you know, that's something that I, I try to remind myself about, you know, is really kind of keep keep going, keep working, you know, keep the keep the negative the negativity or the the rejections away from your art practice and you know um just keep keep producing work and also like you know don't be afraid of technology um i'm obviously not a technophile you know i do a lot of digital work but i also um do a lot of you know hand process work i think it's important to utilize both when you need to or when you can you know websites and instagram especially today like instagram has really become like a hub for artists it's like an easy way to have an online portfolio mm -hmm. i have a website um and then but honestly like if you want to see what i'm doing like just check out my instagram account because it's the it's easy to upload stuff there you know and you don't really have to like visit me to see what i'm doing like the feed will pop up stuff that i'm doing and I think it's important um, to kind of utilize that stuff as an artist, whether you're older and more established or you're coming up, like get your work out there, disseminate it, let people check it out. All right, you guys, that is it for today. Um, I just want to say again, thanks so much, Marty, for doing this. It's just really fun getting to talk to you. Yeah, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, everybody. It's good to meet you all virtually. <laughs> All right, goodbye, Facebook. And we're off. <laughs>